This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014, an interview with Alita Rosario, the president of Wise Girl Entertainment. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and I am here with uh, uh, Lita Rosario from uh, Wise uh, Girl Entertainment uh, where you are an attorney uh, of course. Uh, and so hi Lita and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Fine, how are you? It's great to be here Andrea. Uh, it's great to have you here and so uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, uh, so what is Wise Girl Entertainment all about and uh, sure. uh, where you come from? Sure, um, I'm an attorney by profession and um, I started out actually my my career as a corporate securities lawyer and uh, by happenstance my roommate in college was Crystal Waters oh, wow. and I <laughs> negotiated Crystal's uh, first recording contract with the Basement Boys back in the late 80s um, early 90s along with a colleague of mine who went to law school with me who was actually practicing entertainment law um, I got him to help out and that was kind of my first um, you know venture into entertainment law um, and after that I ended up co-owning a record label in um, Washington DC that produced Drew Hill and Maya and of course Cisco yeah. and so that's how I got started out um, I went on to represent Missy Elliott Tank and many other artists songwriters producers and others and um, currently I'm working with George Clinton and the estate of Gary Scheider diaper man from Parliament Funkadelic um, assisting them with their uh, copyright terminations and yeah. otherwise with royalty collection. Um, I successfully helped Africa Bambada and Soul Sonic Force get back their copyrights last year. Um, and so I'm on a mission to help as many yeah. artists as possible recover their rights and recover any royalties that are owed to them. Absolutely. And so let's talk about termination rights. I, I did sure. a, a piece last year here South by uh, around termination rights, but uh, can you just explain to the viewers uh, uh, really briefly uh, what, what the issues are? About. Sure. Um, termination rights um, are a right, a statutory right, a right that's given under the Copyright Act of 1976, um, Section 203 of the Act, for works that are created after 19 uh, January 1, 1978. Yeah. Uh, well, well, actually, works that are transferred, that the rights are transferred after January 1, 1978, um, 35 years hence, they are allowed to basically send notices to whomever the current owners of their copyrights are and recapture their copyrights. Yeah. Um, the It's a limited uh, right because it affects only U.S., so it doesn't actually affect them in the rest of the world, yeah. although a lot of people feel a lot of attorneys and, you know, others or solicitors, etc., outside of the U.S. and the U.K. and in Europe and the EU in general think that there might be a way to kind of bootstrap what happens in the U.S. because if the contract gave rights all around the world, yeah. there might be a right to terminate around the world, but probably there would have to be some lawsuits over in the in the EU in order to secure that. But yeah. for sure, for the U.S., it's a way for songwriters and recording artists to recapture their rights. Um, for works that are made pre uh, or were transferred pre-January 1, 1978. It's actually a longer period. It's a 56-year period, so they have a longer wait to go. And um, they're and also the, older, which is not helpful. <laughs> exactly, and those rights are actually technically called renewal rights. They're right. under Section 304 of the Act. Um, but if the if the author passed away in the first 28 years of the term, the heirs actually have an immediate right to take those rights back. So don't just assume that because you're works are pre-78 that you don't have any rights or you have to wait a long right. time you should still seek counsel of an attorney or someone who's knowledgeable on uh, terminations and renewals to see if you can actually secure your rights and get your rights back so sure. this yeah. has uh, potentially a revolutionary effect on um, artists rights and artists ability to you know have ownership of their masters and their musical Absolutely. compositions and to license them to you know independence and to 
to a whole bunch of people that the major labels and other labels are unwilling to license them to and just sure. open up a door for them to start to get real compensation for their works because many of them are stuck in recording contracts and 35 years later the recording companies are still saying they're hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars unrecouped and still not entitled to any royalties even though their music is being exploited all over the internet it's being exploited still being sold hard copy cds download streaming um, and all other kinds of uses in movies and tv shows and they're not getting any compensation it's insane and so looking at uh, uh, how it's um, it's evolved uh, so that the the uh, termination right uh, really started uh uh, last year uh, uh, yeah well the uh, earliest sure the, the earliest, earliest that um, an artist could terminate for or uh, an author for someone whose works were transferred uh, after January 178 was 2013 right the latest date that they have for that it's a five year window so it's 2018 but right. there has to be a minimum of two years notice to the current owner so that means 2016 is a drop dead date yeah. for works created in 1978 so it's important I'm so happy that you're doing this it's important that authors and this applies to book authors or fine artists it applies to wow, any I types know, of I, I art didn't, I didn't realize that. exactly any type of rights that are cover, covered under the copyright wow. act so book authors fine artists photographers, um, photographers from magazine, I guess. exactly photographers and even other like graphic artists there's an interesting uh, twist on this because for instance let's just take Nike as a hypothetical I don't know what artists actually created their logo yeah. but those artists who created logos for trademarks if they transferred their rights and it wasn't a work made for hire they can actually seek to recover their rights as well wow. so it's very far reaching it has very far reaching Im implications um, and certainly um, for the artists who maybe retain their publishing or for one reason or another own their rights and didn't ever transfer them to a label or to a third party but let's say they licensed the rights for it to be used in a movie or they licensed it for a tv commercial yeah. they can also terminate and get those rights back and for instance if it's in a movie the film company has no other choice but to, to renew it to renew <laughs> and to pay a new fee Oh my gosh, so, that, this, so that, is, this is a and, wide reach. Exactly, wide and facts. you should never do it in perpetuity. If you're, if, and for, for artists who do get their rights back, the one thing they should remember, or two things they should remember, is that they should not resell them to anyone. They should keep them. It's a pension. Yeah. The royalties, the, the income, what it represents is a way, you know, in the U.S. now, because, you know, finally we joined the rest of the industrialized world and extended copyright to life plus 70 years. That means it's your life if you're the author, yeah. plus a couple of generations after you who can earn money off of your creative work. So it's very important not to do a whole transfer and sell all the rights off again. Yeah. If you do anything, license it for a period of time, five years, 10 years probably at the max. Um, but it's also good uh, as, a, as, a, as an estate for, for your exactly. spouse or your children or anything exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly, for your heirs, exactly. So it's inheritance rights. So yeah. it's very important and um, I think in general uh, creative people are more open to new technologies and to working with independent companies yeah. independent filmmakers and independent TV and video producers have a very hard time licensing rights to popular music because yeah. major labels just want too much money the major publishers they want too much money they're not flexible enough to agree to things even that would pay you know out on a royalty basis sure and looking at uh, uh, you know, we're talking about whether last year the debate was whether there would be any counter legal actions from labels or any dilly dallying yes. on, on getting this yes. action. So, so what is what is what is happening there? Are you seeing good well, results? Well, um, there's been a couple of lawsuits. Um, one which involved the pre seventy eight works was the Bob Marley estate lawsuit, um, and unfortunately, the judge in New York and federal court in New York ruled that the works were works made for hire. We didn't talk about that quietly, but there's a little twist 
twist on termination because they're if, trying to make them yes pass. if they were if the works were works made for hire then you don't have a right of termination right. so but there's a Supreme Court case in the United States that says that um, a work isn't a work for hire just because it says so on a contract that the author actually had to be an employee or yeah. the works have to be enumerated in Section 101 of the Copyright Act, which master recordings and musical compositions are not listed there. Neither are books, neither are, you know, prints for fine artists. Yeah. Um, TV and film is included. So TV and unfortunately... People, creative people who have done TV and film work don't have termination rights because right. they are considered works made for hire. Sure. But they probably had a salary as well. Exactly, exactly. So they've been paid, so it's a little different. Yeah. Um, but for in the Bob Marley case, even though Chris Blackwell himself testified that he did not intend Bob Marley's works to be works made for hire, <laughs> Universal <laughs> argued that they were, and the judge ruled on summary judgment, meaning without a jury, that they were works made for hire. Wow. Um, Bob Marley's estate filed a, uh, an appeal and they settled and the set, the settlement is under seal. So we don't know actually what happened. I'm sure he, they got paid money, whether or not they got any of the ownership rights. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, the other case was the village people case, yeah. um, which was out in California. Um, and in that case, um, the court successfully ruled that in the village people's case, number one, that they weren't, that the songs that were done by the village people were not works made for hire. Right. But the court also ruled that if there's something kind of quirky in, in the copyright ad in section 203 that says that all of the um, grantors, a majority of the grantors have to consent to the termination and sign the termination notice. Yeah. However, that court clarified that if only one grantor has signed the agreement, then only that one grantor need terminate. So right. for instance, with the village people, each one of them signed a separate music publishing agreement. So each one of them separately can terminate without the other members. Yeah. So that was very significant. There's actually a trial coming up as well in that case um, in April, I believe, April or May on the last issue that's left in that case which is whether or not a manager was given part ownership of the copyright even though he didn't actually write any of the songs okay. and so uh -huh. they're they're trying to terminate his interest as well so that's actually going to trial yeah. so we'll see what happens with that um, and more recently I just um, argued effectively a case out of the 11th circuit in the United States uh, federal court which is Florida covers Florida, Georgia, um, and Alabama, I believe, maybe Mississippi too, um, just a ruling that um, the courts have federal, that the federal courts have jurisdiction to determine whether or not these termination notices are actually ripe for review by a court, even before the effective date of termination, Right. Because you have to give two notice. to ten years notice as long as the copyright office has yeah. actually received the filing and they've accepted the filing and sent you back your formal um, record. You know, you have to record these notices with the copyright office. Yeah. So as long as that has happened, the courts can review the validity of those notices. So that was an important decision as well. So one of the things that uh, I was covering was the copyright uh, review, not reform review of, uh, from uh, Maria Polante uh, last year for other World uh, Creator Summit uh, yes. and uh, so that was quite a fresh thing back then yes. but as uh, you know we all know that the Obama administration has had a, a number of things to deal with so has anything happened on that front or is that going to um, be just that in the water? No that's still up um, you know Congress there were some hearings recently on reform of the Copyright Act in general and this question of termination has come up now of course the record companies music publishing companies book publishers they all want to limit the rights more and more yeah. so there's got to be some strong artist lobby to make sure that those rights are actually enforced. And that's what we'll be talking about the panel here at South by Southwest this week. Yeah. We'll be talking about that and, and trying to make sure that, you know, the artist rights are properly represented and that if there are amendments that they're amended in a way that are beneficial to creators and not in a way that's only beneficial to the publishers and the record companies. Of course, because we know there's, there's lobbies in, 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 in these things and, uh, you know, there's uh, representatives from the tech industry that want something to happen and exactly. representatives from the artist industries that, of course, uh, have more I guess, of a voice uh, if they come together. Uh, yes. They need to come together for that. Yes, they're going to have to come together for that. So hopefully we will be able to
able to get a group of artists together who can come forward and testify. And I think one of the, the legislative history of Section 203 talks about how one of the reasons for termination rights is so that artists get a second bite at the apple, that yeah. they didn't have really an opportunity to have an arm's length negotiation when they originally signed the rights away because most of them are not discovered yet. Their works haven't been published yet and no one knows the true value of them. Yeah. And um, particularly with the record companies, the recruitment structure, as I said, many of these artists, 20, 30 years later, the labels are still saying there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars unrecouped, yeah. which seems absolutely <laughs> incredible. It's, it's and most really artists don't have the finances to actually... To go, fight that. To fight that, Exactly, yeah. to fight it. And, um, you know, basically, they're kind of in the equivalent of a sharecropping situation because the recoupment that the labels are saying is not repaid, a lot of that is the cost to actually make the records. So while they're charging the artist for the cost to make the record out of their royalty, which typically in the United States on an album is about a dollar and 15 cents yeah. uh, before the various deductions and things that they take. So they're charging all that ch cost over to the artist royalty account. So why shouldn't the artist own it at the end of the day? It only <laughs> makes good sense. Yeah, exactly. Especially after so many years. And, and we know that if an artist uh, is still unrecouped uh, after this long of a time, they probably found another career path and they may or not be able to ask for some sort of accounting or, or, exactly. or, or looking at the books. And, it's, and not only that, it's difficult because um, we have statutes of limitation in the U.S. and typically yeah. the statute of limitations are less than 10 years. In most states, there are three to six years. That's as far back as you can go if you haven't gotten an accounting. You yeah. can't go back to inception and get them to actually prove an account for how they come up with these ridiculous unrecouped balances. So yeah. termination rights are really important. Perfect. Well, uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you. And uh, I'm sure if people want to know more, can they follow you? Are you on Twitter? Do, do you have oh, a, a social media presence? I'm, of, of I'm sorry, I don't have a big social <laughs> media presence. But you do um, have a, a website. I do. My website is wyzgirl, G I R L dot com. And there's actually quite a bit of uh, information on there on what you do and lots of resources. So I'm sure people can find out yes. uh, a lot more on the website. Right. And, or, and, uh, mm -hmm, or if you need some help, you need a representative to help you terminate. I'm sorry certainly there to help for that reason. I'm working on a lot of them now. I'm working on, as I said, Parliament Funkadelic. I'm working on Peaches and Herb um, and numerous others that are, are up. That's fantastic. Well, thanks, Lita. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com and the videos on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.